correct each one of us as we go through this psalm. That we might learn more about how to please you as we live our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 51. Prayer of penitence or repentance to the chief musician of Psalm of David, the nation that protected him after he had gone into Bathsheba. David was the anointed king of Israel, a great man of God, although he's not seen in his best light in here. I'm so glad that my sins aren't put up like this for everyone to read. But I'm not looking at that so much, but rather the steps that he goes through in this psalm of confession and repentance, because they are the same that we are to go through when we sin. Please remain seated if you are going to remain sinlessly perfect for this entire year. Obviously, I'm preaching to myself. I now know why the Lord wants me to speak on this subject. Just briefly, it's about David's sin and repentance after Nathan rebuked him. It would have taken courage for Nathan the prophet to rebuke the king of Israel. David was on the top of his house, and I'm glad I've got a low set house. David looked down, and he saw Bathsheba taking a bath, and it tempted him. I would blame the woman myself, she should have been more modest. <laughs> but that wouldn't fool God. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 28, that any man who looks on a woman of lust in his heart is as guilty as if he had committed adultery. That for men, and I guess it applies to women too, is an incredibly challenging statement. Bathsheba conceived and bore a child and God struck the child and it died. Very hard to understand how a loving God can do things like that. But he is sovereign and in his divine will he did it. Please remember that although that young child did not have a life on this earth, it would have in soul and spirit immediately gone to the upper section of Sheol, referred to as Abraham's bosom and will enjoy eternity with the Lord. David sent Uriah the Hittite to the front of the battle and made sure he was positioned right at the front where he would be killed and he was. And he married Bathsheba and Solomon was born and Solomon went on to be king in his place. David was not allowed to build the temple because even though he desired to, because his hands were the ones that had shed blood. One of those battles was the one where Uriah the Hittite was killed. And so we go through and look at these different steps. As we come to the first one, I'll read through in sections. The first one I'll call Sin Thoroughly Judged Before God. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you make me to know wisdom. We could spend a month on this psalm, but I just want to bring out a few thoughts. <coughs> Thorough judgment before God, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. 
against you only have I sinned. Well, obviously, he sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah. But ultimately, all sin is against God. And I could claim that I'd never done what David did. But God doesn't grade sin the way we do. We do, or mankind does. I told a lie to my father about 58 years ago, and that was sin. And that was what led me to come and give my life to the Lord. And that one lie, I could argue it was only a little lie, it wasn't like this, but it was enough to keep me out of the heaven for eternity, but for the grace, the mercy and forgiveness of God. He has done evil in your sight. God is all seeing and all knowing. Psalm 139 says, Where shall I go from your presence? No matter where you go, you cannot hide anything from God. And that is a sobering thought. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Sometimes I'm afraid <laughs> because... David's mother is not named in scripture, but she is in Jewish writing. But she is described in the Psalms as being a godly woman. All, all of us have been born with that sinful nature, and all of us need a saviour, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. You see him in your own children, and it doesn't take long to see that sinful nature in your own children. They learn the word no very quickly. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Much as I love Christmas and the joy of the birth of the Saviour, some of the words of the modern carols disturb me. Truth in the inward parts, and yet we see some of these carols that are uh, sung on the TV. They are attributing divine attributes of God to non-existent fables. God declares that he is a jealous God. In fact, he declares that his name is jealousy. And we need to be careful about attributing things that belong to God to stories, good and wonderful, where they are. I'm not for one second criticising the Christmas service here. It was wonderfully done by all who did it, but it just concerns me. With God, what belongs to God, he is jealous of what is rightly his. Let's go on to the second section, forgiveness and cleansing through the blood and water. Forgive me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Blot out all my iniquities. The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far shall I remove all your transgressions. It says, your sins and your iniquities I will not remember anymore. I wish I could forget some of mine, even though I know God has forgiven them. Creating me a clean heart, fully washed and cleansed. Initially and primarily through the blood of Jesus Christ as we remember, for without the shedding of blood there can be no remission of sin. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. And that should be our prayer for each one of us. Yes, if there's a little shrub which with with which the blood and water of purification were applied. Scripture references there if you want them. Cleansing in Scripture is twofold. Of a sinner from the guilt of sin, and that is the blood and hyssop aspect. Sins past, present and future are forgiven and heaven are assured. But in Romans 6, 1, Paul says, Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer comes firmly, far be the thought. Someone to come up with the idea that if Christians keep on sinning, people see us keep on being forgiven and grace being given to us. 
It would be a good demonstration that Paul refutes that absolutely. We're not sinless, but we should sin less. The second one is of a sake from the defilement of sin. And that's where, and I hate to have to admit it, having given my life to the Lord at eight years of age, I've sinned more since I became a believer than I did before. And it's a terribly sobering but truthful statement. Both aspects of cleansing by blood and by water are brought out in John 13 and 10. That's where the Lord washed the disciples' feet. And Peter's request, impetuous as always, he wanted to be what had more than his feet washed. But the answer comes back, who is, but he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. But we need forgiveness and we need cleansing from the defilement of sin day by day. It might be only a little white lie of that sin. It might be only an unkind thought or a statement that that is sin and we need constant cleansing from it. And water also is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, living water. 1 Corinthians 6 11 says, and such were some of you that you were washed and you were sanctified and you are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. A wonderful passage of Scripture. Ephesians 5, 25. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That's a blood aspect. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish. That's of the church, but the church is made up of individuals like you and I. Just as clear, fresh water cleanses our bodies, God's written word washes us clean deep down inside our souls. It purifies our thoughts, scrubs our motives and cleanses our conscience as we absorb it and obey its truths. Why bathe just once a day when you can bathe constantly? There's plenty of fresh water. There's no water bill coming in. You can bathe and be cleansed repeatedly all day long. If you like baths, soak in the tub all day long. The Jews had ritual baths for cleansing from defilement and they were going there as a token of being cleansed. So by reading the word of God we can be cleansed. But why not use it? Not if we've sinned only but rather as preventative medicine. It is very hard to sin whilst reading the Bible although you can. I could be reading a Bible and think I remember that preacher who got this text wrong. He should have listened to me after all. That would be sin of pride, spiritual pride, and it's wrong. Meditate and marinate on the Word. Marinate on the Word? Have I lost my marbles? No, I'm wearing my chef's hat for a minute. We don't eat hearts in Australia very much, but in many countries you eat the hearts of an animal. As a young boy, I got a mini poultry farm and I used to sell the heart and the kidneys and the liver and everything else to my mother and she had to cook them up and I charged the extra for it. But the heart is a very tough muscle and you need to either slow cook it or greatly marinate it. Marinating adds flavour, but it also tenderises. You put in some olive oil, you put in some garlic, you put in some chilli, you put in some all sorts of things. You can even put wine in because it burns up the alcohol, or red wine vinegar. Then you put more garlic and then you put more chilli in. And it will break down the tissues of the meat and soften and tender, tenderise it until it is wonderfully tender hard. So also should we be. One example from scripture, we used to carry letters of commendation and if we went from church to 
church so people would know you were a believer. In 2 Corinthians 3, 1, Paul speaks about the church there. He speaks of the believers as a letter, the Bible, a living Bible. People could look on them and see Christ in them. Written not with ink, but on the fleshy tables of the heart. Is your heart tender enough to be used in this way? Because it says that they were observed all day long. We at Living Hope, as we go about our daily lives, are observed and watched by under believers. Do they see the truth of the Word of God coming out in our daily lives? Why does our heart need constant cleansing? Reading Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. You see, we can have all the outward truth on the outside, but the Lord searches our heart. Key verse is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we need to do that on a regular basis. Number three aspect is the spirit filled for joy and power. It says, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. That first section, you never need to pray as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Restore to me the joy, sorry, do not cast me away from your presence. The Lord promised in the Great Commission, I will never leave you. He said, I will always be with you. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Nor will he ever take our Holy Spirit away from us. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. You know, remember the joy when you first came to faith in the Lord, the excitement bubbling up within you. So also when we are freshly forgiven by the Lord when we sin, there is that restoration of the joy of being saved from the defilement of sin. And uphold me by your generous spirit. Restoration of fellowship after forgiveness and fellowship maintained in abundance. Number four, that joy is immediately, immediately results in service for the Lord. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. There's plenty of transgressors out there who need to know God's ways. They may not want to know it. In fact, they'll do everything they can to get away from it. But there's never been a time when we need to share the gospel more than now. This world gets increasingly wicked. And sinners shall be converted to the Lord. How we long to see the gospel preached and revival break out. We can all preach the gospel firstly by the lives we live. Secondly, by seeing every conversation we have as a stranger with a potentially mission spot. Talk to them, change the subject. Talk to them about the Lord and share about your joy in the Lord and all that he has done for you. Number five is the end result. Worship and true fellowship of the Lord as a restored believer. It says, Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. It seems even David had a memory of his past sin. And he thought about it. And that can be a good and a bad thing. It's a reminder to spare us on in service for the Lord when we realise just how much He has forgiven us. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. So Lord, open my lips, for my mouth shall <coughs> say forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I will give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. 
sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And that's what I want to leave with you this morning, this saying. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousnesses. Yes, even my tongue that can't sing very well. But what a joy to sing aloud from the righteousnesses of God. Oh Lord, let this be our prayer in this year to come. Oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth or declare your praise. May that be our primary aim this year coming and every year that our lips will open and show forth our thanksgiving to Him who continually saves us when we fail over and over again. What a great loving God we have. And I put it at the book right there, number six, because that's prophetic and relates into the future and time is up. I concluded that this year, let us seek earnestly to be free of sin and all that will come between us and the Lord, so that sinners will be saved, and our heartfelt cry might be, O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. Father, we do just thank you for such a great salvation. We thank you for such a great Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. Be with each one, we pray, that we might live a life that is pleasing to you. May we bring praise and honour and glory to you every day of our lives. May we share the new good news of salvation with those around us so that they too might come into the joy of salvation. We ask it as we give you thanks for this time together. In Jesus' worthy and precious name.